Hey, this is Kevin from Kevin's Barbecue Joints, and we are super excited to have this episode sponsored by The Smoke Sheet, which is a weekly newsletter that I have been a subscriber since day one. It was started by Ryan Cooper, who is the barbecue tourist, and Sean Ludwig, who is NYC Barbecue. Uh, so, so great. Barbecue news, openings, closures of barbecue joints, links to really cool podcasts, book recommendations, a recipe a week. Super easy to sign up, just your name and your email, and weekly you will get an email that is chock full of information. Every time I get it, there's something new I didn't know about. And as I've mentioned, I love the fact that they have barbecue events in it because I'm always the last to know about barbecue events. So this way you can stay on top of them, plan ahead, make sure you get to go to them. There's so many cool barbecue events every year. So sign up, it's barbecuenewsletter.com. It's barbecuenewsletter.com, barbecue news worth consuming. Check it out. You're going to love it. And in this episode, I get a chance to talk to Hugh Magnum from Mighty Quinn's Barbecue in New York, but they have multiple locations now, upwards of nine locations. This is a really great story. Uh, I don't want to get too into it because we get really in depth and it's, it's, it's over an hour, but you're going to enjoy every moment of it. it. Like many of these stories, he didn't start out in barbecue. He actually started out in music, and that's an interesting portion of his life. And then how he got into the culinary world, and then how he got into barbecue, That uh, those little steps are super interesting. It's also so crazy because he gets so deep into the emotional component of this journey. And at one point he only had $600 to his name and he had a, a wife and kids and the pressure of that and what that pressure was and what he learned from that pressure and what he appreciates now that he is at this point where they're growing so rapidly and uh, we talk about the early days of Mighty Quinn's Barbecue and uh, you're going you're to really, really love it. I can't thank you enough for sharing the time and uh, and if you're digging these, please subscribe. That way you don't miss out. I have a website at kevinsbbqjoints.com but enjoy this. Good morning, good afternoon. How you doing? I'm good, man. You? I'm do- doing well. I'm glad I got a- finally got a chance to talk to you. Likewise. <laughs> glad, glad that we could chat. All right. Where are you right now? I'm in uh, my commissary in Passaic, New Jersey. Uh, we, we have uh, four big smokers here. It's, we uh, smoke and deliver to the restaurants that don't have smokers in them. Gotcha. Okay. Well, well cool. Well, I, want, I wanted to talk about your history a little bit and then about, about Mighty Quinn's, the, the, how it started and, and what it's all about. And then cause there's a lot of cool stuff coming up, too. So we'll try to, I'll try to make it brief. People don't have great intention spans these days but uh so yeah did you grow up on the east coast and then you came to la is that how no it was it was actually the opposite i grew up in los angeles i was actually born in hollywood at the old cedar sinai which used to be on hollywood boulevard Yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, before they moved it to cross from the beverly center where it is now by la cienega um so i was born in los angeles and i lived there through 1999 okay uh i mean i i on and off. I mean, I lived in Boston for a year, went to Berklee College of Music, um, and I spent a lot of time touring as a musician. Um, but I mainly was, you know, LA based until 99. I picked up and moved to New York uh, to go to culinary school. Okay. And what was the band? Uh, a few different bands. I, was, I played in many. Um, one in particular was uh, Maypole. Uh, we were signed to Sony's work group. Okay. Um, we toured on and off for, my God, you know, a few years, but we did two years as the opening act for the Wallflowers oh, wow. uh, on their Bringing Down the Horse tour, which was like their biggest record. Okay. Um, you know, other notable bands, there was one called uh, Enemy, which was a band that I was in with Troy Van Leeuwen uh, and a guy named Eddie Nappy, but Troy is currently the guitarist for Queens of the Stone Age. Oh, wow. Okay, cool. Wow, that's very cool. Yeah, it was, it was uh, I got to, to live the dream somewhat, you know, I didn't get to have the rock star complete lifestyle but I, I had i got to have some fun you know so did you tour overseas too or was it just united states no it was all u.s u.s stuff all u.s that's a cool so that's like a cool little part of your life that's it's different than what you're doing but it's still like it, you have a notable life now but it's just a, it's different yeah exactly i mean it, it was um i'd say the the cool part is i got to live the childhood dream of you know being in a rock band and going on tour it just you know, if the levels are here, like this is like the big time. It was like I was right over. Here. I was like on the threshold, but never got really past it. You know? But if you made it to that level, you probably wouldn't be talking to me right now. 
No, I wouldn't. But I also probably wouldn't be sitting in Passaic, New Jersey. I'd probably be sitting by somewhere, you know? <laughs> That's true. And, and when do you come to L.A.? Do you ever hook up with those guys again and play? Do you ever? So we haven't played in a while. Um, I mean, I, I still have my drum sets and play. And my, my sons, I've got three kids, Quinn, Lucas, and Henry. Um, and Lucas and Henry are, are big into music. But Lucas in particular has taken uh, a liking to the drums. He plays oh. guitar and drums. And oh, he's that. He's already at, at age uh, 14. He's a crusher and destroys m my level of talent. But, <laughs> That's know, awesome. Infinity. Um, but no, when I come out to L.A., um, I mean, mainly when I'm in Los Angeles, I only spend about a week there a month at this point because I'm in New York most of the time. And uh, my wife and kids are currently in L.A., um, but that is kind of a temporary move. Um, but when I'm out there, I've seen like I, uh, Hans, who's the singer-songwriter of Maypole, he had a birthday party like about a month and a half ago. And we actually, for the first time in like 20 years, the entire group was together. Uh, oh, that's at, really. It was great. So it was really great seeing everybody. And, you know, we're all still really good friends. And like, that's a part of our lives that we remember very fondly. And um, you'll you know, always have that connection. That'll be really cool. Yeah. And it was the best of times, you know. So then how did this, was there, how did the transition happen? You, so you went to culinary school. Was that something too that happened to, do, happened to deal with your father? Was your father really into food? Yeah. So, you know, my father, the two things that my father and I shared kind of most as like passion points when I was a kid were food and baseball. Um, I, I'm no longer a huge baseball fan, uh, not because I hate it, but just because like American sports to me have just kind of become pretty boring and money oriented and you know teams used to be like you could follow like I was an Ozzy Smith fan and I could follow the Cardinals for 10 years exactly like the same crew and now it's like every year you can't keep track of who's on what team and it's all about the money and um but anyway I, I digress but uh that's a that's a real legitimate li digression because like with Steve Garvey I was a Steve Garvey fan because I lived in LA and then yeah. when he went to the Padres I was like what that like that was a big deal like but nowadays yeah, yeah. people every three years change yeah yeah, yeah and Ozzy actually came from the Padres to the Cardinals and uh, the Cardinals were like my team yeah yeah um, okay so I used to go to every Cardinals homestand um I would go to every Cardinals homestand when they were at Dodger Stadium. Mm -hmm. So my dad and I would go. But food was just something we shared. My father uh, worked for the government, and he, he had a very um, well-traveled life. Yeah. Uh, he lived in Japan for a while. He basically spent so much time in different places. Japan, Japanese food. I was eating sushi when I was, you know, six years old. And um, we would do barbecue road trips because that was part of his heritage being from Houston. Huh. Um, and there was one place in Los Angeles. Hold on. I'm gonna, there, we're about to serve a staff meal right where I'm sitting. So I'm going to move. Okay. No worries. This is like the real thing. This is really happening. <laughs> That's though um, no, I love this. Actually, this is like a, a big thing that I like. I'll actually take you to kind of where it all started, which is kind of funny. So I'm, I'm walking in, in my commissary, which is 13,000 square feet, but we have literally like, as I'm going this way, you'll see this is all the all of our wood. Oh, cool! Um, indoors with, with, because of the winter. But where I'm about to sit is actually uh, this is my smoker that I used to take to Smorgasburg. Oh. Um, so that's that's pretty cool. Yeah. So I'll, I'll I'll throw us on some wood, and the smoker will be in the background. Um, <laughs> nice. It's like it was meant to be. I'm putting you on the smoker. There you go. That makes sense. Um, okay, cool. So. So, so yeah, my father road tripped a ton, um, or, you know, he lived in various places. So food was kind of our focus. And then we started, you know, doing like, when I was a little kid, we do, you know, barbecue stuff in Los Angeles. And there was one place in, in LA in particular that was actually kind of like the place that I thought was the best, which was called, um, still there, I believe, called Dr. Hogley Wogley's Tyler, Texas. It's still there. It's still there, yeah. In, uh, in Van Nuys, I believe on Roscoe, right? Yeah, yeah. It's like, it's like Roscoe and... Lancashire or something. Yeah, and and it, I mean it's it, it, I don't I haven't been in I mean it's got to be thirty years at this point or twenty five years, um, but that was like that was the place. Um, sorry, the compressor for the heat was going off right where I was standing. So <laughs> it's like I'm a I'm a walking barrage of, of crap. Um, so that that kind of started the barbecue thing, and then we had a pit in the backyard, so my dad would do barbecue, and then. Fast forward to when I was a touring musician. My father had moved back to Houston at that point from Los Angeles because oh. he he really didn't really love L.A. Um, he was there because I was there and uh, he was married there. And um, so whenever I would go to Texas on tour, 
we would stop and I would get to hang with my dad and we'd go to Dozier's, which is where he went as a kid. And we go to, you know, good company and, and basically just make the rounds all gotcha. the places near Houston. Yeah. Um, and Hinz's and all these great places. And it was just something that was always in my vernacular and kind of part of my, kind of part of my core, yeah, you know, DNA, but I just yeah. didn't really, I, I didn't know that it was something I was going to do. I just knew that I loved food and, you know, music was what I was doing. Um, and then fast forward to, uh, 1998, uh, my father passed away, uh, very unexpectedly. So and sorry. When he passed away. Oh no, no, I mean like it's, it's what sent me, you know, it's like everyone has their journey Yeah, yeah. and you know, it's like everyone has their moment and it's like, you know, you go from being a kid to an adult and that was kind of like a turning point for me. So when he passed away, he left me a little bit of money and what I chose to do to honor that was my relationship with him was so based around food and, and passion for it because he was such a passionate guy um, and well-spoken and well-traveled that I, I decided to pick up from Los Angeles. Well, actually, I didn't decide to pick up from Los Angeles. I decided to go to culinary school with the money he left. Okay. Um, I originally tried to go to school in Los Angeles, um, in South Pasadena. Yeah, yeah. I think it's La Cordon Bleu. Mm -hmm. um, and when I w this is, I mean, the timing of this was 1999. I was applying and that was when, you know, like Food Network was hitting its apex yeah, in exactly. that first kind of stage of like Emerald kicking it up a notch and, you know, <laughs> Bobby Flay, who who I'm lucky enough now to call like a, a good friend and, and, you know, he and Michael Simon, Michael's my mentor. Um, but at that that was the time where it was like, you know, he was doing uh, that show, Chillin' and Chillin' and all that. Stuff. Was that the, with that with that Cajun guy? Or? Uh, yeah, Jack. What's his name? Yeah, I forget. He used to wear overalls, right? Or something or? Yes, yes, yes. And he was actually, like, from Philadelphia, which is the funny part. <laughs> well, I didn't know that. Um, wait, like, everybody was, like, thinking, oh, I want to be the next Food Network star. There was that show, you know. Everyone was going to culinary school. So, um, Le Cordon Bleu was filled up for, like, an 18-month wait. And at the time, I was still touring uh, with, with Enemy at the time. And um, we were going to go on kind of a break because Troy was also playing guitar in a band called uh, um, A Perfect Circle, oh. uh, which had just, like... Their debut record came out, so he was leaving to go out to Japan oh, with them. Maynard, wow. um, so I had kind of a window of time where I had to go to school if I wanted to do it. So I started looking at schools, and FCI in New York uh, was on my radar. And it was six months. It was an immersion program. It had, like, the kind of the, the cachet of having Jacques Pan, oh. you know, as, like, one of the deans and one of, like, the, you know, so that's kind of cool. And um, so I literally got on a flight to New York to go find an apartment because I had a hundred pound Rottweiler. So I needed to find a place that would take dogs. Okay. I did like a two day tour of New York, uh, found an apartment, flew back to LA. And then within four weeks had packed up my apartment in Los Angeles. I was living in Miracle Mile, uh, packed it all up with my dog and drove across the country to, you know, go move into an apartment in the East village wow. on fifth street and second Avenue. That's crazy. So then, so with when with when you so you got the money, you went to culinary school. But then also too, yeah. were you thinking while you were at culinary school, I need to come up with an idea for a restaurant, or were you thinking I'm going to no. work, work at a restaurant in New York somewhere? Wasn't even on my radar whatsoever. Um, I had no I had no intention of going to culinary school to do any culinary work. I had the thought of I do music, and if this thing doesn't work out at some point. Uh, like the hours are kind of similar and it's something oh. I love. So I might as well learn how to do it well. And I also thought like, I mean, truthfully, I was like, well, if I learn how to cook really, really well, then, you know, I'm going to be a, I'm going to be a good catch for a woman. Some Exactly. No, I went to culinary school in LA, like just for that reason. So I know how to cook well. But there you go. And, and so the irony of that story was when I called to get into school to, to apply to FCI, I wanted to go for the September semester and it was full. So I was waitlisted and I got a call two or three days after being waitlisted that one spot had opened up and fast forward almost a year. Um, I was, I was like six weeks into school and I met this girl, Laura, who I saw her coming down the steps and I was like, holy crap, my knees buckled. Like I had like a light bulb moment. <laughs> She's my wife now. Oh, that's great. Um, she was actually traveling in Italy and in France, and she decided she wanted to stay in Europe longer, so she postponed her semester, one oh, semester. So she was the spot that opened up for me, was her. Oh, that's so, so she weird. Actually, oh, that is bizarre. Isn't that crazy? That's awesome. Yeah, we found we found that out like a year after we were together. So oh, that's even better. That's even better. Yeah, it was cool. So, <laughs> so, that, so then I went to culinary school, and 
I fell into it. I, I, I was excelling. It just, I, it kind of clicked. Um, so I did well. I graduated, you know, like top of class and um, ended up doing a trail over at um, John George in Nougatine. Oh, wow. And Greg Brandon on my first day offered me um, a job and I actually turned it down <laughs> because, well, I turned the full-time job down because I was still doing music. Okay. And the, the beauty of it was that Greg, who's still a friend, um, is a drummer. He's actually a huge Tool fan, oh. but he, um, he's a drummer and he totally got like what I was doing. So I got to work. The, the deal we made was I will work when I'm in New York, but I, this way I didn't have to, I wasn't getting paid. I was basically working for free, but it was like full time while I was in New York, but then I could pick up and leave if I needed to, to go to LA to do music stuff. Wow, um, so awesome. I was still traveling to LA on weekends and, um, but then working at, uh, at JG at, at Nougatine when I was in New York. That's great. That's great experience too. Wow. You must've learned a lot. And then, and then it, it culminated in a negative way um, with 9-11 happened. And uh, once that happened, everything kind of went haywire for all the restaurants and obviously for New York and for oh, the yeah. world. But um, that was kind of a turning point where, you know, I was there for a couple more months and then decided that my wife and I decided we were going to buy a house like out in the sticks in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, wow. um, which we actually bought my father-in-law's place there. And oh, that's wow. kind of what started me on, on the barbecue path because I was doing it as a side hustle and for fun. While we had that house, I got that got my first like barrel smoker. Okay. And I was doing it like I was smoking meat like whenever I had time off. It was like that was what I was doing with my weekends. You oh, know? that's re- so. Then how did smorgasbord? Smorg happened. I mean, this is we're talking. You know, your the t- the amount of time between that and smorg is almost seven and a half years. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah, that would be yeah about seven years. Yeah. Yeah. So I was I was smoking as a hobby. Um, and then I took over with a venture capitalist from New York. I took over a, um, a general store in the middle of this like little village called Carversville oh. in Pennsylvania. Okay. And I was doing gourmet to go. And then one day a week I would smoke meat on this barrel smoker and sell it. You know, just do like do my own barbecue. And it got to the point where people would call in advance and pre-order and we would sell out before we opened on oh. pre-orders. Um, so then myself and my best friend, uh, his name is John Criswell, decided to invest in a 16-foot-long trailer smoker okay. so I could do catering and I could increase the volume. And, um, you know, Quinn, my, my youngest or my oldest, my firstborn son, uh, came, came, he, uh, came into the world in 2003. Okay. And so that was when the name happened within about a year of that. It was like this genesis of like we just one day we're just like oh mighty quins and it was like whoa it just it, it just sounded good and it was like it wasn't too like barbecueish no. you know it was kind of like it, it didn't it didn't convey barbecue which I kind of liked because we've never been like the cartoon pig company um, <laughs> exactly which is nothing wrong with that it's just like it was just not my vibe you mm-hmm. know so I started doing catering and then we we bottled the sauce and Whole Foods picked us up in the Mid Atlantic region wow um, that's a and big deal. we we. It was great. We crushed it. We sold out like, you know, in a few weeks. And then we had had one investor and uh, who will remain nameless. John and I had an investor. And uh, right before we went to go to production to go like nationally with Whole Foods, so we had gotten picked up. Mm-hmm. Um, he got served with like divorce papers or, you know, something crazy where like he, he like he's had to pull out. So we uh, had no money. Like his world so crashed that kind around. Of, that, that kind of put an end to it. Um, so, yeah. That's uh, that was that was the that was the genesis of the first incarnation of the business. Okay. Um, and uh, so then what happened was it like it just went from being a business to not being a business, and I was struggling to make ends meet. I was kind of you know taking jobs cooking wherever I could. I had at this point you know we were about to have my God a couple of years later we we were on our on Henry we have Lucas and then Henry was coming to the world in two thousand six. Um, then we bought a house before we sold the house and literally timed the market as poorly as you can. <laughs> yeah, um, that was right. <laughs> yeah, we bought top of market and then the market went. Uh-huh. So uh, we got our asses handed to us, uh, sat on two houses for six years, lost one house, um, you know, literally went full on bankrupt, lost everything. Every penny I had in savings was gone. Um, and it's weird. It's, um, I look back at it and think about how dark a place I was mm-hmm. in when that was all going down. But I also realized that it was so necessary. Um, I had always been like, I'd always been really lucky. I'd always like, I'd walk in for a gig 
whether it was drums or, you know, whatever. And I would get it, you know, and like this was the first time like I had gotten not just like kneecapped, but like kneecapped in my face, <laughs> rubbed, rubbed in shit. You I know? in the back of the head um, with a bat. Yeah, I got, I got completely clobbered. Um, but no, this is actually really good for people. I hate to interrupt you, but for people too, because they can get a chance to see, you know, they, some of them might be in a pretty dark place watching this or listening to this and realize that yeah. you can get out because there's a lot of, like, it's, there's a lot of people that struggle, like most people. Oh struggle. no. And, and to your point, man, I mean, it, it was a dark place. And I, and I also, it's, it's funny because like, there's a couple takeaways, like there was parts of that. I mean, it was, you know, the dark place lasted a couple of years, you know, of trying to dig our, ourselves out, but also flailing a bit. And um, I can honestly say, like, there's times that I look back, I'm like, man, I, I'm not proud of, like, my reaction to certain things, mm -hmm. you know, like, I, but at the same time, I had to kind of go through that to get to a place where I could hit, you know, hit the time where I pulled my bootstraps up and started this thing, you know? Because you feel kind of cornered that at that point too, like you feel like everything's coming in. Yeah, you feel you know you feel cornered, but it's also like um, you, you know, like the weight of life is on you too. It's like a weird. Yeah, thing. I would like to say that like oh yeah, I reacted great and I handled it, and you know it was like lickety split, but it wasn't. You know, I um, I had some some times where I was just like I was useless, and you know it, I hate to use the term, but like you feel kind of castrated. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like I, I had a wife and three kids who I couldn't provide for. And that, like, you know, that's like, yeah. Um, so like that was, that wasn't just like hard. That was like gut wrenching, but also like debilitating. Mm -hmm. And there was a time where I totally just shut down in the midst of that. Oh. And, um, which sucks. And, but, but again, it's like, you know, you don't know till you know. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I went through that and, um, my mother-in-law, Kathy, and her husband Andy took us. Uh, they have like they have like a timeshare style vacation thing where they can go to all these places. And they were doing Disney World, and they invited like my kids and the cousins and my in laws. We all we all went down. And um, I remember like it's so weird. It's like certain things that are so vivid. But we were we were waiting in line for the Finding Nemo uh, like play at Disney World, and um, my phone rang. And it was, uh, his name is Adam. Um, and Adam is, Adam Johnson. Adam is my wife, Laura's cousin. And Adam is like this awesome, like full of life guy who always, he's like the guy who always has an idea. Um, but not always like, like there, there are ideas that are not always flushed out. But right now he's currently like, I mean, like he has an amazing business now. And actually, so the business he had started is a business called Withers and Grain. Um, and they do like amazing furniture. He, they handcraft wood and repurpose wood. And, but he called me, said, Oh, there's, there's a flea market we're, we're selling at where we launched Withers and Grain called the Brooklyn Flea. And, you know, I think if you came here with your smoker and sold, you know, pulled pork, you would crush it. You'd make, uh, you know, a couple grand every weekend. And it was like, I hung up, I was like, cool. I'm, I said, I'm, I'm in line for finding Nemo, but I, then, <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, this sounds awesome. And I'll call you as soon as I get back you know, back up to Jersey. And, um, you know, like a week later, Adam and I spoke and I got the information of, um, the names were Jonathan Butler and Eric Demby and they had Brooklyn flea and, uh, was able to set up a meeting, a face to face where I would, I would come in and do a tasting for them. So, I mean, we're talking, this is 2010. Um, so I drove like food hot off the smoker in a little Cambro hot box uh, yeah. drove to Brooklyn, uh, to their office in Dumbo. And, uh, you know, came in with the, the hot food and did a tasting and they were like, we love everything. They said, the one dilemma is we have a guy doing barbecue huh. at the flea. But in a couple of months in April, we're launching a new concept called Smorgasburg, which will be food only. Huh. Would you be yeah. interested? And before they could even say, would you, I was like, I was over the table. <laughs> like I'm in, I got this. Yeah, lock I'm it all in, over yeah. it. Yeah. So, um, and to their, to their credit, they're super loyal, which is why they didn't want to allow me into the, I appreciate that, you know? Um, so anyway, uh, April rolled around and I was trying to get permitting for Smorg and it was proving a little harder to get, you know, temporary permits. So I had my buddy, Fred Strackhouse, who had a restaurant uh, close by my house in Jersey. He was cool enough to um, lie or let me use his address to say that I was using his kitchen as a commissary. When in fact, I was in my driveway, my gravel driveway with coolers. And, you know, I had tables set up and I was literally smoking in my driveway. 
so I got my, my permits and I remember like it was, it was the weekend or yeah, it was the weekend previous to 4th of July, 4th of July that year, 2010, I guess it was. And, um, yeah, 2010. And I was like, I had, I had five briskets on the smoker, uh, four pork butts, and I think like 12 racks of ribs that I was going to smoke on site. And I was in a total panic, like, oh my God, like to my wife, to Laura, I was like, what, what if they don't like this? And she just plain as day me and said, you know, if we don't sell any food, then we'll just bring it home and we'll invite everybody over and we'll basically have a going out of business sale, you know, on life and we'll be getting out of the house and we'll go move in with my in-law, you know, with the in-laws. So, um, that was kind of like equal parts scary as shit, but also like (laughs) she kind of allowed me the space to like, you know, she basically was like, I'm going to be here no matter what. And we're going to be a family no matter what. So like, just do it. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that gave you the ability to succeed. It gave me the ability to be free enough to go Mm -hmm. for it. And so she came with me and um, Alex Stanko, who is currently like been our executive chef forever, um, who's still with the company. um, They came with me, it was the three of us. And we sold out in like 90 minutes. And it was like this amazing explosion of energy, just like feeling so good doing something that like we didn't just believe in, but like it just... It just felt good, you know? It was like we were doing something we loved. We had fun. We were all together. My wife had hand-drawn the sign, you know, like on on a chalkboard. um, But we didn't know, but the Wall Street Journal was there doing photographs for for an article they were going to run online regarding Smorgasburg, this new food flea market. And by the way, the the market started a couple months prior, but I was taking time to get permitting, so I was coming in, like, you know, six weeks after everyone else. Oh, okay, okay. So like the next, I think it was like Monday, someone reached out to me and said, oh, your, your pictures on, on this article from the Wall Street Journal online. And I was, the cover photo was me and Alex like reaching over at food. So like overnight that happened. And, um, then an email went out to all the vendors, like a hundred vendors that were there saying that Unique Eats, a show on cooking channel, uh, was going to be doing a smorgasbord episode oh wow um and they were going to be reaching out to three vendors so if anyone you know gets uh, an email from such and such you know from irene irene wong productions that um, it's real and yeah that, that it's real you know <laughs> and literally not 10 minutes later i got the email and i was like holy shit i've been there for one like it was my first time out and all of a sudden like i'm one of the three vendors I think I saw that episode. It, it aired, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and so that was like, the, there was like a perfect storm with that because it aired and there was three vendors. And then the next year, it aired while Smorgasburg was like dwindling d- down in the spring, or I'm sorry, not in the spring, in, in the fall before like, there was no winter smorg that first year. So then when spring picked up though, I was the only vendor of the three that returned. One of them like lost, you know, just decided to not do it anymore. And one was like had gone on to do something else in a different place like i think moved somewhere else and so it was just me and so all of a sudden everyone was coming to the market looking for like the vendors that were on that show and i was the only one so there was like there was that perfect storm and then there was just this thing where i think like we were just fucking hungry man like we were just hungry to like succeed but we were also just having so much fun that it was so genuine like we were, I, I don't know if you've ever read Eckhart Tolle, um, but like he's, you know, he, he, he's like, he writes books on like, you know, it's like the power of now mm-hmm. and being present. And there's something really true to be said about like when you're connected to the moment and everything, like when we were there and we were doing this and, and the, like there was the ascent was happening, nothing else mattered. Like, it was just, like, when I was, like, connecting with you as the customer slicing meat in that line, like, every customer, like, I was looking at in the eyes and having fun with and an interaction with. And it was, like, it was a real organic thing that was happening. And life feels that, right at that moment, too. Like, things feel... Yeah, and it was, like, you know, and then there's Malcolm Gladwell's whole concept of, like, the tipping point. You mm-hmm. know, like, I had done, unbeknownst to me, I had done 10,000 hours of work on that smoker mm-hmm. with all the other stuff I had done. So when I showed up at Smorg and a lot of vendors like, you know, would, let's say, maybe be sitting down waiting for people to approach them. Like we were just engaging everybody. We like 
you know, the smoker was there. We had music playing. Like, we were, like, you know, just geeking out and having fun. And it was, like... It's infectious, and it's... Yeah, you know, I, I think, like, um, I recently heard a talk with uh, the writer Elizabeth Gilbert. I don't know if you if you know the name, but she wrote You Pray Love, oh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. which is her, yeah. her most famous book. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they talk about, like, there, there was this whole talk about she's written, like, you know, ten books or nine books, but everyone, and You Pray Love was her fourth book, but everyone that recognizes her will be like, oh, I loved your first book. Interesting. And, like, it, even though it wasn't her first book because it was her hit, you mm -hmm. know? And the, the comment she made that, like, resonated so much was, like, she and she said it's like it, you know there's no need to correct anybody because it's so easy to not be a dick like just be appreciative <laughs> yeah, yeah you know and like i i was so grateful for the moment that i was having that i was so present and connected but like i was having the moment as much as the customers mm -hmm. were having the moment so like it wasn't just this phenomenon for for the customers or for you know for you know my kids or for my, me it was like it was an all-inclusive moment that we were all a part of like wow. we were all a part of this thing you know and and i still feel like that's that's the genesis and kind of the love of like when i think about like cooking barbecue it's more now it's more a matter of like this awesome opportunity that came up through like this love this shared love that we all were a part of that yeah, 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 and that's that's a kind of a beautiful thing, and it's and it's something that you'll always treasure as to why this yeah. actually happened. And and a lot of people yeah, think and, people just start restaurants to start restaurants. It's not. That's yeah, not and look, thing. I mean, we were, you know, we ended up being kind of the golden child of Smorg because we were the first vendor that showed up without a, a brick and mortar to go brick and mortar, mm -hmm. and you know, obviously the New York Times looked on us favorably, and that that review that Pete Wells wrote was. I mean, talk about a fucking game changer, man. Like that was, uh, that, that was a moment, like I referenced, um, there was an interview I heard with Steve Carell and he was saying how like the greatest moment for an actor or an actress is getting the call that you got the part. And the scariest moment for an actor or an actress is the moment you hang up the phone and you're like, oh shit, now I have to do this. <laughs> and that was the New York Times for me. It was like, you know, in culinary school, you know, the Wednesday dining in section or dining, you know, dining section of New York times is like, it's the Bible yeah. Even and here on the West coast. It is. Yeah. It was. Yeah, it's yeah. the record, yeah. you know, it's globally. It is. And, um, when that review came out, it was like, it was like winning the Academy award, man. Like nothing, like no matter how bad things could ever get at this point, like if I have a bad day, like, or like a bad year or whatever, like that, that moment, like I, that will never be taken away. Like I value that. Like I, that's that's placed so deep in my heart that like that will, that will never leave me. You know. So did you get investors at that time? Did people come to you? Yeah. So yeah. So I, I digress. I'll, I'll, I actually I jumped way ahead. But so I was at Smorg. Things were going amazing. We were obviously like it was just the groundswell was building, building lines were building, um, and then you know at one point my mother was out in New York from Los Angeles with her husband, my stepfather, Stan. And um, I was talking to them about like what I've been doing at Smorgasburg and kind of the, the conversation steered towards like, I started to have, you know, to work with this idea after going to Chipotle on the way back home every time. So then Stan's son, Misha, yeah. uh, Stan reached out to Misha and Misha was living in New York so Misha and I hadn't ever really hung together and it wasn't for a, for a lack of like, it was just a timing thing. But when he was going into high school, I was already off on the road when like our parents got together. So it was just like, it was one of those things where we never really, we only crossed paths a few times, but obviously we were friendly enough and we got together and discussed it, you know, discussed like the idea like that, you know, that uh, of what to do with this thing, that this phenomenon that was happening. And um, he then you know, it was, I guess, crunching some numbers. Then he brought his brother-in-law, Christos, who is a second generation restaurateur, Christos Gormos. Um, he was a partner in the Venetian, one of the owners of the Venetian, which is like the largest catering hall in New Jersey. Okay. And he brought him to see me at Smorgasburg. And like one of the stories that I always tell, but it's like, it's the way Chris told it, told it to me was that he, he showed up at that market saying to Misha, I will never do a restaurant ever again. Cause he was doing the catering and it was going great. And, um, wow. he watched me work for like 20 or 30 minutes and just kind of watched the whole thing. 
and tasted the food. And then he looked over at Misha and said, I don't know about you, but I'm gonna, I want to back this guy. <laughs> So like he changed, he did a, a 180, you know, and like that was, that was like, that was it. You know, it was so funny because like the next week we were like starting to look at places, like looking at spaces, you know, available spaces. And I remember like I hadn't, I had had a few people offer to invest in me to open a restaurant. And I just never really, I never really took any bait on that. Not because I didn't want to, but it just like, I was just too busy in the moment to think about it at that moment. So when this was happening, it just seemed right. Mm -hmm. And then I remember like the three of us were at dinner and I was like, so wait, like, are we partners? Like, is this <laughs> happening? And they were like, yeah, you dumbass." You know, like it, it just, it was so funny because like it, it sounds it, like it a reaction I'd have too. <laughs> yeah. It, it just, it just happened so naturally. And so organically, like everything else had happened that it just, the, the partnership was formed without having to, you know, without it ever having to be made official until like I, was like, wait, what the fuck? Is this really happening? You know? Um, Forgive me if I'm trying to figure out with, with the Chipotle thing, how does that tie in to what you were doing? Is it just because of the, the, the way that the streamline this? It, it was, all it was, was a, it was like a light bulb moment because um, when I would leave Smorgasburg, I was exhausted and I had that big trailer on the back of the truck. So I couldn't park in the city, like stop and get food in the city. So I would stop in Bridgewater, New Jersey. There's a Chipotle <laughs> in the mall okay. in, Brid in the Bridgewater Commons and it was the only place that I, I, I could pull into I could take a double spot it didn't matter I could park the trailer there and I would stop there because that's about 30 minutes from where my house was and I would grab food for everybody who had worked for the day but also for my kids because at that point like I was making like cash it was like Goodfellas cash like literally like stacks of cash you know which was freaking awesome you know like I, I was uh, we were down to our last 600 bucks before this thing started, you know? Um, so then, um, while waiting in line, because the Chipotle always had a line going, I was watching the line work and I was watching the way, like everything was, was laid out, but there was still this, like, there was an interaction, even if it wasn't the way, like we, I, I realized that what we were doing where I would slice the meat and, Alex, who was next to me, or Jamie, who ended up working for me, his name as well, would put the pickles and the sauce on. And then, you know, my wife or my, you know, my friend Rebecca, who also worked for us, would then do the money or Rebecca would work. It was interchangeable. There was three of us. And it was like this efficiency of like meat topping money. Gotcha. And it just, it dawned on me that all the barbecue travels I'd had with my father, it was either sit down where you didn't see the smoker and it was coming from the back or you might see a smoker or some kind of hint of it or smell it if you were in Texas, but it was cafeteria style, but it was all like on these steam wells mm -hmm. where nothing was being cut and it was all under heat lamps and it all looked really sad. And it just dawned on me that like the cutting of the meat, like there's this visceral thing Without a doubt. that people were reacting to when I was slicing the brisket in front of them, that if we were to take that component and plug it into a Chipotle style line, we would be the first barbecue technically like doing this QSR thing, mm -hmm. but like really smoking the meat, like not hard boiling, not, you know, cooking in ovens, you know, it was like real barbecue. And, um, so that was kind of the genesis that that was the beginning, the, the inkling of a seed of Genesis to get into the idea. And then where Misha came in to play big with that was that when the, that inkling of an idea started, he was able to take that, and really, he's a number guy. He was so he was working in hedge funds, so he was able to take that and then start working real numbers and metrics and say like, this is like this is what we can do, and this is the numbers we can do, and this is like how many people we can serve. Like it was all it was all like that was the the, the matrix shit that I can't I, I have no mind for. I'm like I can tell you what tastes good, what looks good, and like you know what music sounds good but beyond that like i'm an idea guy but i'm like I'm, they jokingly call me the poet like i'm the i'm like the art guy and those guys know much more about business um so then you know it it seemed like a good kind of triangle because misha was very money oriented and very smart with that and i was not and i was a passion guy with about the food and the vibe and, and the music and the look 
And Chris was so great with operations. He had been through build outs. He had been through restaurants. He had come up in restaurants. That was so helpful. That was so helpful. It was a perfect kind of triangle that we all were good at certain things um, and respected each other. So, yeah, then we started looking for spaces and we found one space we really wanted that was actually in Brooklyn. And um, we just had a hard time negotiating the space. It was like this old, um, like, car garage, uh, like, auto body shop. And it was, it, it would have been thing that ever happened to us for it to not have come to fruition because everyone was gravitating towards Brooklyn. Because yeah. um, there was kind of this influx of barbecue that has, there was one at that time called Fet Sao, but mm -hmm. before, after Fet Sao, there was nobody else uh, at that moment except for them. And so then after we opened, and the time we opened, other barbecue places started opening up in Brooklyn, we ended up on East 6th Street, which was one block from where my original apartment was. East Village was the only place I'd ever lived. Um, there was perfect. like this, Chris found something in, in his coat pocket from a coat check with this guy's name on it, totally weird. And it was like the owner of this building that the restaurant that was there had just gone out of business and they were looking for a tenant. It hadn't even hit the market yet. Wow. And that was, the restaurant was called Van Dag, but it had previously been like six other restaurants in 10 years. Which failed is, all of them failed which is one was, it was actually a barbecue place as well um so it had like the new york kiss of death and then we went and looked at the place and we were like i i literally the words that i said was jump on that shit like it was that it was like this is the one this is it and we got it and i think that's one of the the things that separated us from everybody else we opened in manhattan and we had a smoker in the dining room so like i was sleeping in the restaurant you know I, I wasn't going i was only going home on sunday afternoons um so i would spend six days at the restaurant i'd sleep in the office and the smoker was 24 hours a day i would feed wood to it there's no there was no assist on it, it what was type of smoker was it jnr oiler okay. um but it's the the non-e so yeah, yeah. literally there's no electric assist mm -hmm. um so at that point i was such a control freak that i was like i slept in the restaurant i controlled the fire I touched every piece of meat, every cut that went down the line. I had my hands on it, you know, along with Alex. And then, you know, we had a couple of really good core guys that came on. Um, but, like, that was the genesis of the first Mighty Quinns. And, and what was the menu at that time? The menu when we first opened was everything we have now, with, with the exception of a couple of sides that were different. Like, we had an edamame salad that was seasonal. Like, like the things that we've just switched out rotated seasonally. Mm -hmm. But a couple of things that were not on the menu, uh, we didn't have anything fried. Um, because when we got the restaurant, we were still waiting for permitting to run a second flu for the smoker. Okay. Um, but we can't open a barbecue place without a smoker. So we literally diverted into the other flu, that, which is what the hood was oh, for, for the that. fryers. <laughs> oh, interesting. So, but you can't combine creosote with fryer oil, no. you know, vapors. Um, very dangerous. So we couldn't do anything fried. And then eventually when we got the second flu, the second exhaust put in, that was you know dedicated for the fryers then we put the wing the wings like the, all that stuff was done we just couldn't do it until we had well and then it's back. new york is very difficult yeah. for that yeah. yeah yeah so that's uh and that how was, was what was the yeah. reaction in the neighborhood what were people saying I, I mean there was like a couple people that hated us in the building that had been like you know they were, you know, rent controlled in the building and they were like, it smells like barbecue. Da, da, da. Oh, that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That. yeah. But I mean, the, the place that was there before us and the place before that were open till two in the morning. They were like full bars, like, you know, crazy. And, uh, you know, we were closing at 11 o'clock. Actually, we did, we, we stayed open till like one in the morning, I think the first weekend. And then when we realized like that we actually had to be there like waiting on these people that were like going to throw up because they were so drunk. Like that was the clientele after 11, yeah, you know, we were like, you. okay, this is just stupid, yeah. you know? So we, um, so we, we nixed that quickly, but we are beer only. So, you know, we, we tried to become more of a, a neighborhood place mm -hmm. was our goal. And I think we succeeded in that with the exception of like a couple of rent control people who just, you know, were curmudgeons just for the sake of being curmudgeons. And they, they would have been pissed no matter what went in the building. And know? were you selling out at the time? No, we were not. I mean, we. I mean, we were doing fine, um, but the smoker's capacity uh, nightly on that smoker with hot spots, I could do forty-eight briskets. Um, and at that point, we were not selling forty-eight briskets a day. We were. I mean, we were selling a lot of food, but no. That this was December twelfth, 
or December 19th, 2012 is when we opened. Um, so, I mean, we were busy, but by no stretch were we like selling out. We were comfortably, we were comfortably selling food, but not to the point where we were selling out. Uh, where the mayhem ensued was March, I believe it was March 6th of, of 13, okay. was the night that the Pete Wells review happened. And from that point on, it was fucking mayhem. <laughs> we got to the point where 48 briskets on, on the oiler, and then the smoker I just showed you, we had set up in the parking lot of the Venetian in New Jersey. So I would run to New Jersey and smoke on that smoker too. So we were doing 15 briskets there and 48, and that still wasn't enough. We were selling out of- Beef ribs too at that time? Yeah, we were doing everything. Oh. I mean, and we were maxing the smoker out. Like the smoker was literally to the gills. Um, we had to order a second set of shelves because we couldn't clean them fast enough. So we would just take the dirty shelves out <laughs> and put the clean ones in, you know, and then work rotations. Um, it was like I would clean the smoker where I take the shelves out and jump in and like do a scrub down while it was still hot gotcha. because we just didn't have time to shut it down. We were selling out the first like week. Um, we couldn't play catch up fast enough because obviously with barbecue, you have to work kind of two days ahead, not in the smoke, but like, you know, I'm seasoning today for what I'm going to mm -hmm. smoke tomorrow yeah. and what I'm smoking tomorrow won't be ready until the day after that because it goes overnight. So the first like three, four days of that New York Times review, we were literally having to close the doors at 7 p.m. And that works if you're, you know, on the road in Austin, Texas with, you know, $1,000 a month in rent, you know, or whatever, yeah. you know, but at the rents we pay in New York, like, it's not viable to close early. Mm -hmm. You know, you just have to increase what you, your volume. And so at that point, we were going through, oh um, my God, 48 like yeah, 63 briskets a day wow. we were selling. That's crazy. And, yeah, I think I think the largest amount of people we served in the day was like 1600 people out of the out of the East Village and that was with 55 seats to give you a perspective. That's amazing. So a lot of to-go yeah. business too. Yeah, it was it was crazy. It was nuts, but it was like the greatest it was the greatest mayhem ever and it was like a bubble. I was in, like, it was the Mighty Quinn's bubble because I, like, anything outside the restaurant with the exception of, like, talking to my wife and kids, like, nothing else, like, there, nothing was on my radar. Like, I wouldn't even leave the restaurant to go get food. Like, I would send people to go grab me, like, you know, a falafel from the moons or whatever because I was, like, I couldn't even leave, you wow. know? That's insane. That's insane. So when did you guys open up additional locations? Second location was our Clifton, New Jersey location. Uh, we opened that location up in... Mar March of 2014. Yeah, March of 14. Okay. So once we opened that location, um, we kind of, we, we figured some things out at that location in terms of like sending food to, that, that we could send food to another location if we needed to because we had two smokers working there. Mm -hmm. um, so the beauty of that was that we opened up, the next location after that was Brookfield Place. And the reason we needed Clifton to open up Brookfield was because Brookfield you can't smoke in. Okay. I mean, it's, you know, but, uh, I don't know if you've ever been to Brookfield, but it's like mm. the most high-end, high-end, high-end food court you've ever been to. I mean, it's the most amazing model because it's in the financial district. American Express has their offices next oh. door. So when they go to lunch, you have a thousand people. Basically, like every day from 1130 to 230, it's like... May, that that three hour or two hour window is like the busiest dinner at any any other restaurant wow. for, for all there's like eight restaurants that are there and none of it is like fast food all of us are like you know high-end fast casual and or just like you know doing really great stuff like you've got blue ribbon sushi uh fuku uh my gosh um dig in dos toros chopped you know and then us so it's like it's all localized new york vendors in there um but we needed a smoker off-site for that location. Gotcha. So Clifton proved to be the off-site smoker for that location. Wow. So what's the, the progression from it? It, it basically, it, it, you know, honestly, it was kind of, we opened Clifton, then Battery Park, and then, and then the locations were easier to open because once we realized we could do it, you know, we were just opening a few more locations. And then, you know, honestly, you know, we've got five in New York now. Um, the international market was kind of the next step mm -hmm. where we, we partnered with franchisees. The first ones were in Taiwan. Um, and that kind of taught us that, that franchisees who cared um, 
could do well with it because we, you know, like we would, they would come here and we would train them and then we would go there. Most of the, the like all the international franchises like to open, I, I would go there for two to three weeks along with, you know, either John Logston, who's our, our director of ops, um, who also is an accomplished chef um, or Alex and then Chris and Misha would also come over. So we would get all the teams open properly and then we do checks. So I'm, I'm supposed to actually fly to Dubai uh, in four weeks to go there for there's like a thing called Gulf Food, which is like this oh. food show competition thing. And there's like a barbecue piece to that. So they want me to be there for that. Um, currently, I'm, I'm figuring out what days I got to go because I have a potential thing with Food Network that week right before it. So like it's just kind of mayhem. So so you have, so you have Philippines, Dubai and uh, ta- Philippines, and Dubai and, and Taiwan. Yeah, oh, that's ex- yeah, that, that's really exciting. So you have nine locations in the U.S. or is it? So, uh, no, well, yeah, let's see. Um, five in the city, two in Jersey, one in Westchester, Yankee Stadium, and then we just, the first franchisee just signed oh, on for Long Island. Long, oh, Long Island, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there'll be two locations for that, right? Um, I think the goal will be more than two, oh, okay. but I, I'm like, you know, knock on wood, let, let's yeah. get the first one right, and then we'll go from there, you know? Oh, crazy. That's like, a, and, yeah, then, and then are nuts. you thinking possibly to, like, even L.A.? Uh, I mean, you know, Could if, the right opportunity, if the right opportunity presents itself, I think we're open-minded to anything. Um, I mean, we, we're currently in talks for potentially opening Australia, which would be awesome. Awesome. Um, we, we seem to have, like, you know, with Taiwan and Manila, we, we chose places that were going through some, some political issues at the time, which is our timing was funny with that. But, uh, I mean, it's all good. And, I mean, like, again, I'm, I'm happy to be here. You know, like, this for me, it's like, at this point, it's, it's all gravy. A lot of it's gravy, just like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there, there, there's, you know, I'm not talking monetary gravy yet, but the the gravy of just like this thing started in the driveway mm-hmm. and like, you know, look at where where it's gone. It's like, like you it's said, you had six hundred dollars to your name, and now look at this. You have yeah, exactly. So you know, I mean, you know, Chris, Misha, myself, we've we've obviously all put our heart and soul into this thing, and um, it's great to see that it's it's you know starting to kind of branch out and. You know, there's like this really cool feeling of like, you know, we have like 300 employees, you know, globally or more that are, you know, that, you know, I was like begging for work essentially, you know, 10 years ago. And, and you know, here we are, like we're, we're able to give people a chance. And, you know, hopefully like what I've noticed is like you said, there's a huge takeaway to like showing people that like you can fail mm-hmm. miserably and still, you know, that can be a huge uh it can end up being a win if you if you choose to harness it properly. You know, I like to say I failed forward. You know, yeah, yeah, that's great. And then, like, I want to wrap kind of wrap it up with what's up with the the bike cycling. You cycle a lot, right? <laughs> a lot. Um, yeah. So, um, I mean, that goes back to like the, those dark days. Um, I I kind of got into riding at that point. I mean, riding is something that like we all riding a bike is the first moment that all of us, you, me, my kids anybody has an ounce of freedom Mm -hmm. it's like if you think about like the first time you got on a bike without training wheels and you turn the corner like where your parents can't see you anymore like there's that rush of like holy shit i'm on my own Mm -hmm. like freedom you know what i mean so as a kid that was like my freedom like riding bikes and skateboarding um but then when i was an adult and we were going through a complete financial fucking destruction the only time that I felt like nothing but the moment was when I was like on a bike, on my bike going up a hill. It hurt, but it hurt so good because I wasn't thinking about being behind on my mortgage. I wasn't thinking about That's interesting. the bills I couldn't pay. I wasn't thinking about like, what the fuck am I going to do next? I was just thinking about get up the fucking hill. You know what I mean? Like, so, like, there's this beautiful connection to mm-hmm. it. So, for me, it there's that piece. And then, so that was the first leg of it where it represents it represents kind of clarity and peace and presence for mm-hmm. me. Um, so, I had done it just for that and loved it. And um, we opened the first location, like I said, December of 2012. And for that first six to eight months, like my bike just stayed in a corner because I was working my ass off and, you know, doing what I had to do. And I don't regret any of that, but, um, I was drinking probably like the equivalent of six, you know, beers a day and 
um, cause I was just trying to get myself to go to take 30 minute naps, you know, like however I could as fast as I could. So I'd like shoot a founder's porter, you know, at two in the morning and nap for 30 minutes and then shoot another one. And, um, and I was up to a hundred and 78 pounds, which I'm five, nine. And like for my frame, that's a little big. Um, and I just didn't feel healthy. And I had, I had a, a moment on new year's Eve, the following new year's Eve, the, after the first year we were open where I had kind of a heart scare that ended up not being as bad as what it sounds like. It was just an abnormal EKG on a physical and it's a long story, but I ended up rushing to the ER with my family there. And, um, my 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 wife's stepfather who is on the board of the hospital came and saw me there and like said your lungs are in great shape your heart it just seems basically it was like i was like kind of having a constant like i had like a an arrhythmia but i had like a i was in like a constant state of like a panic attack okay. without even knowing it. it was just the way i was operating um and he basically said like you need to exercise you know like you need to get back to doing something that that gets your body moving again and um so I started riding at that point just to like do it again, you know, and, um, two and a half years ago, uh, my agent who is also a f my friend, Scott Feldman's his name. Um, he and, uh, his like right hand, Sarah Jane Coolahan sat me, we were sitting down for a meeting to kind of go over like the stuff that I had, you know, coming up on the agenda for like TV or, or anything potential. And they've been, they've been like, with me since I, my first show was back in 2008. I was, uh, I was Michael and Simon sous chef on a TV show called Cook Like an Iron Chef. And mm -hmm. I love that show, but I don't think a lot of people know about that show. That was, yeah, awesome. it was on Cooking Channel. Yeah, yeah. You know? and, and my, it was a cool and set. Michael, it was, yeah. Yeah, the set was awesome. We actually, we were the last show ever filmed on in Horvath Studios, uh, which is on West 12th Street. After oh. that show was done, they, they tore the building down and uh, repurposed it. Oh, okay. Um, but, uh, I didn't know that. Yeah, Michael is like one of my close friends and he's been a mentor. And um, so Scott is his agent and he connected me with Scott. And I was lucky enough that Scott, like, I, I mean, Scott doesn't take people on unless he sees something. And like, I don't know what he saw, but he took me on. And um, so they've been su support for me for a long time. And even when I was, wasn't doing shit. And um, this Sarah Jane and Scott knew of this chef named Chef Jason Roberts who is now a good friend of mine, um, who started a ride called Chef Cycle. Okay. And Chef Cycle is an arm, or they raise money for No Kid Hungry, which No Kid Hungry and Share Our Strength are what all like the New York City food and wine, like yeah. the, it all goes to Share Our Strength. And they said, oh, they, you know, they do a, a yearly ride and you should you know, take a look at it. And it, this is Jason's brainchild. And you know he's an awesome dude from Australia. And um, so I looked into it and signed on for a ride that was like three months later and I had to raise money for it. And, um, I, I started just like, you know, making sure I was riding more and I went and did it. And it was like, it wasn't just awesome. It was, it was like utopia because it was 300 chefs hanging out or 250 chefs hanging out in Santa Rosa, California. Huh. And, um, already that sounds body. awesome. Yeah, and we were all riding bikes, and it was the, the coolest part that, like, not everyone talks about, but, like, most of the time when we all get together, when any of us chefs, like, we hang in a, in a large group, it's, like, things like New York City Food and Wine or South Beach, which are amazing, and, like, they're so much fun to do, but you're always kind of, like, looking over your shoulder, checking out what your buddy did, and it's, like, there's, like, a, there's an air of competition, even without it being a competition, you know, because mm -hmm. um, you're measuring yourself against other people, and... But at Chef Cycle in Santa Rosa, like, we're all, none of us are cooking there. We're just, like, together and hanging out. It's like summer camp, you know? And, you know, some of us, like, there's, a, you know, there's, like, a handful of us who are, like, guys who race and who take it pretty seriously. Um, myself, uh, you know, Jason, Jeff Mann, you know, Seamus Mullen. And, and like, these oh. are guys who, through Chef Cycle, like, we all became friends and, you know, like, Travis Strickland and Brian Dunsmore, they, like all these dudes, Travis Flood, like Lentine Alexis, we've all become like family. And they're like in, in literally within a matter of four days, like I, on that trip, I made lifelong friends. That's amazing. You know, and, and it's because we share something outside of what we do, you know? Um, and like, I, you know, Jeff is a prime example. Like, you know, 
Jeff had a rough year last year in, in terms of, I mean, he's had a great year, but he, he, um, his father passed away and like, you know, like I felt for him because like, even though we only hung for three days, like Jeff has become someone who I care deeply about, you know, and, and Jason, you know, who lives in Australia, you know, like he'll, he'll see if I like, he'll hear, or I'll, I'll post something that maybe looks like I'm not as happy that day and he'll call to check on me. And like, that's invaluable. Like, that's we're, huge. We're, that's we're, amazing. That's yeah. Huge, yeah. And it's infectious. And you know, the thing with riding for me is, um, I've become far healthier since, since being a part of chef cycle and, you know, I've lost like 40 pounds from that 178. And, um, I eat better now. doesn't mean I don't eat barbecue. I just pay more attention mm -hmm. to, to what I do because I've got three kids that I want them to see a healthy lifestyle as an example. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I've been really fortunate like that I, that I ride, I can kind of ride fast and, you know, like I've been lucky and I have, um, you know, some like brand ambassadorships with that now and, that's really um, cool. Yeah, I've noticed yeah, photos on Instagram you, of you cycling. I'm so. over it because I, I know that like not everyone like is into that. They're like, show me some food, show me some food. But uh, no, the cycling cool. is like, we all. I think um, Malcolm Gladwell, the writer, said it best, where it was like, he thinks that anyone who doesn't have an obsession outside of their work is off. Like there's some, like everyone needs something that they daydream about doing outside of their work. That's, that's like, important. You know, like whether it's running or tennis or golf or cycling. Or like people that you know are works work in offices and dream about you know firing up the smoker and cooking yeah, yeah. the barbecue. You know, it's like we all need we all need that like outside passion. No, it's know? important if you don't have it. You it's almost hard to exist. It's hard to yeah. to go forward. Yeah, and and my wife is similar. She runs. Laura runs, and so I you know between like the two of us, like our kids have an example of two parents who like don't like to sit yeah, that's down. important. Oh, we have to go, and I think that like for them, it's like a good example of like you know, just get up and go. Yeah, know? yeah, definitely. Well, Hugh, thank you. Like we could talk for another hour and I, I, yeah, I man, so, if you want, if you want, if you want more info or, you know, you want to chat more, just let me know. Thanks so much and have a great rest of your week. And I, you so too, appreciate, I appreciate the time.